Welcome to Moon Traders, the podcast where we explore the world of trading and learn from the best in the business. Join us as we deep dive into strategies, techniques, and the mindset of successful traders from around the globe. Our goal is to help you build your own edge in the market and achieve your trading dreams. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn from the masters on Moon Traders. I had the pleasure of speaking with Richard Brennan, who is a diversified systematic trend trader who's been trading the market since 1980. I learned a ton in this podcast, and I know you'll absolutely love it. So let's start the show. Hey, Richard, how's it going today? Yeah, really good, Moondev. Great to be on your show. Um, Thanks very much for bringing me on. Thanks so much for making the time, man. I would love to just dive straight into it and hear a little bit more about your approach to trading, Richard. Sure, go for it. So what were you doing before trading? Well, before I, I got interested in trading, I, um, so I, I started trading in about uh, the mid-1980s. And uh, before that, I'd completed a degree in um, in geology and uh at the time that I left, the particular specialty that I'd, I'd focused on, uh, there weren't many opportunities available at that time. So um, I then uh, did a, a course in business, a, a business degree as well to top that off, um, thinking that I might get into sort of the management side of um, geology. But that swung me into finance. It, it, when I was involved in finance, that I started getting in um interested in trading um, at a, a fairly early age at about 25, 24. So yeah, bef- before that, uh, more sciencey business type thing. And, and, um, and then uh, when I, when I went into finance, I, I got involved with a, a firm that the managing director had a, a strong interest in um, the stock market. And he also with his firm, he sort of pivoted the firm from a, a, a tourism related business uh, that had interests up uh, in northern Queensland and uh, pivoted that into being a um, what you call a responsible entity here in Australia, which is effectively like a trustee that um, ASIC has these responsible entities that basically provide a degree of protection to clients uh, for those fund managers seeking to do a, a retail um, fund. Those fund managers will umbrella underneath the responsible entity who provides um, a degree of compliance and protection uh, for retail clients and has a, a suitable balance sheet. So in that capacity, in uh, this responsible entity, I was a CFO of the company, started getting involved in compliance and, and looking at some of the funds that were plugging in underneath our structure. And at that time, uh, most of the funds were were strong in sort of value investing. So, uh, you know, my, my sort of heritage is basically starting in the stock market. And uh, the firm also had some brokerage arms um, with it. And uh, there were some senior traders in those brokerage arms. And they, um, they taught me the ropes in relation to a process called spread trading on equities, you know, going along one particular equity and going short another particular equity and looking at the, the value difference between the two. And then from there, when, when I started to get more and more involved in oversight of the fund managers who are under our structure, I got very interested in some of the value investment techniques. So at that stage, I was very much um, assessing company balance sheets, profit and losses, that sort of stuff, looking for value. So I did that for quite a few years, then started getting more involved in the derivative side, um, things like options and c- combining options with um, share trading. I did that for many years until about um, 2012, uh, where I stepped out with a few partners in this this fund, like in this business that I was in. Uh, working in. Um, a couple of others came with me and we started up a small fund here. And that was um, trading derivatives, basically. Um, it was uh, trading the ASX index, basically, with, yeah, it was a bit of a disaster uh, running for about uh, a year or so with a small group of investors who are, you know, family and friends. And then from there, I said, right, I've had enough of this, time to take things seriously. Started getting uh, very interested in this, this, um, 
trend following, uh, diversified systematic trend following. So that's where I've pretty well stayed from about 2013 right up to current day. It's with my head focused in this um, method called diversified systematic trend uh, following. But uh, I suppose uh, worked with a, a programmer um, over the last five or, or 10 years where we sort of developed um, algorithms that allow us to apply these practices, subsequently started offering education and content for retail traders seeking to stand on the shoulders of some of these um, giants in the industry, the practice this method, and uh, applying it to um, products such as Contracts for Difference, which gives a retail trader the ability to get extensive diversification because uh, the offering of CFDs often is in um, micro lots, uh, which therefore allows you to achieve extensive diversification without having to sort of uh, take the step into the futures market where you know, your minimum lot sizes might be one lot and uh, it's difficult for a retail trader to get that level of diversification. But CFDs was our avenue that allowed us to achieve extensive diversification, but with fairly small capital accounts. And uh, we started um, teaching that process to um, some some of uh, the membership that I have on my forum. And, and then subsequent to that, I started working for a fund down in, um, in Sydney, um, East Coast Capital Management. I work as uh, what you call a strategy ambassador for them. So I'm involved in a lot of research and also in um, in some of the fundraising activities for them. And, um, this fund is is specialized in this, this method of trading called diversified systematic trend trading. They've, they've had a track record from um, 1920, so about three and a half years so far, and things are going well with them. And uh, we're it was basically a fund that um, was targeting uh, friends and family and relatives, but now uh, we've, we're about to launch an information memorandum and go to a public offering, but for wholesale investors. Um, so that's basically my my history, Moondev. That's amazing, man. Thank you for taking me through that history. Super interesting. You started with geology, went to business, and that led you to trading. Tell me a little bit more about your approach to trading. You mentioned you're using a diversified systematic trend trading system. What is that? So what, what's um, this particular method um, I'm looking at is looking at this, this universal characteristic we find in these liquid markets. And this is, we find that when we look over very large data sets of any liquid financial market, whether it's a, a futures market, such as a commodities market, such as gold or, or soft commodities, such as um, um, coffee or sugar or corn, or um, if we look at any um, liquid um, stock, any any of the liquid liquid stocks which are fairly highly capitalized, or if we look at um, any bonds, liquid bonds or forex or currencies, we find that over very large data sets they. Their profile is um, what we call non-Gaussian. In other words, their daily distributions of returns don't um, exactly fit within the normal distribution. What we find is that they have what we call a leptokurtic profile. In other words, they have fat tails to those distributions, which means that there's opportunities for traders to who trade quantitatively. Um, so this is different to say value investors or whatever. So a quantitative trader is someone who basically uh, statistically analyzes price data. So for a quantitative trader, we find that when we look at these long-term data sets of any liquid market, we find that there are opportunities in what we call a peak of the distribution. And that is for particular traders that you know, like things such as mean reversion systems, what we call convergent trading systems. In other words, because the distribution has a very high peak that goes beyond what a normal distribution's peak is, it says there is there's arbitrage opportunities in those peaks that can be exploited by those people that adopt convergent systems. And most predictive systems um, are what we call convergent. But then at the tails of the, the distribution, we often get these thick tails of the distribution, this liquid market data. And that's the area that I focus on with what I call this diversified systematic trend following. So I'm looking at these extreme price moves, very large material price moves. And when you look at price data, 
you find that these large price moves are associated with major trending markets. These very large trending markets, you find that there is a property in the data which has a what we call a bias in the data, which is pushing it forward in the direction of the trend. And so we refer to that bias as some um, positive serial correlation. When, when you get that in a data series, um, that's what's giving the underlying momentum to drive that trend forward into the future. So as a diversified systematic trend follower, I'm using systems that wait for these big trends to emerge and then jump on board those trends in the direction that it has been trending with no expectation of, of setting profit targets or whatever, but just riding that trend until its conclusion with my systems. So what that means is that over the, the large data sample or the large trade outcomes sample of you know, 2,000, 4,000 trades, over the very long term, there is an edge associated with that technique um, and that is an edge which is being deployed by a lot of um, these, what, what we call commodity trading advisors, which are, it's, it's a term associated typically in the US for the managed futures industry who trade futures markets, but also now there's um, significant amounts of these firms in Europe, um, a few in Australia. Generally, they, they're well known in the institutional space, but less well known to retail traders. So the way I see it is that the these particular fund managers, and there's there's a large number of them, they've had a very strong validated track record um, over the last 30, 40 years. In fact, a lot of the research that has um, been done in academia about this particular method of, of quantitative trading demonstrates that over, you know, th this trend following idea um, has had legs for the last, you know, 200 or so years with um, this historic data that they've dredged up, uh, whether it's, um, you know, simulated data or whether it's, um, you know, using the, the old data from the, the, the days of the tulip bubble. They, they find that this particular method um, exploits these trends and um, the the reason for those trends well there's there's numerous factors for the potential cause of these trends but they tend to be uh, caused by behavioral biases that when when traders or participants in the market exert these behavioral biases this sets in place this ability to set up these um, enduring trends with serial correlation so good examples where you see this extensional momentum taking place is during market extremes such as the GFC in 2008 where the equity markets were significantly diving if you notice the nature of that those short trades as as the trends started getting more fully developed in the short direction these moves got more and more extreme and you got what we call these capitulation tails where you saw that many traders who weren't on the right side of those trends were being squeezed to death. Therefore, they were they were sort of um, what what they are doing is they were um, their predictive systems that they were deploying no longer worked in these environments because suddenly we had this new environment, an extreme environment that their predictive models couldn't cope with, and so they are abandoning their predict predictive models and and adopting more behavioural tendencies of of flight. When you start losing a lot of money fast. Uh, people tend to often forget about their predictive models and uh, they pull a pin because they can't endure that pain. But as a trend follower, a diversified systematic trend follower who just follows price, we would be watching that price come down. We'd be jumping on board that downward uh, directing trend and taking that full opportunity when those situations arise. And that that's in times of crisis, but we also get these these directional anomalies in times of boom. Um, for instance, the the you know the cryptocurrencies. Uh, we found Bitcoin having a magnificent upward trend, which was well beyond what um, predictive modelers assumed. And uh, we got this significant boom in cryptocurrencies a few years back. A trend follower, if they were trading a, a, a cryptocurrency such as Bitcoin would have been looking at that trend saying, well, it's a liquid market. It's a significant trending opportunity that's directional in nature. I'll jump on board like a surfboard jumping on board a big wave and I'm going to ride that baby um, until it ends. 
we get this in, in all liquid markets. So when we assess this data, as I said, over many, many different types of liquid markets, every liquid market you throw at it over a, a long enough time frame exhibits these properties of, of these, what we call these um, tail properties, uh, which can be seen at certain times, not frequently, but at certain times. Let's take a quick break from the episode because if you're looking at a chart right now and stressing over a position, that means you're trading with emotion and emotions trump your logical brain. So you're not going to be as profitable if you're trading by hand. Now, you might be a unicorn, but for the rest of us, I would definitely learn how to algo trade. And you can learn that in the algo trade camp. Just go to algotradecamp.com, automate all your trading strategies, get rid of emotion, and get back to living life. For any individual particular market over a, a 30 to 40 year time frame, you might only find three or four of these events occurring for a particular market. But that's why we diversify so widely, because when we diversify across hundreds of markets, um, that's what increases our trade frequency, even though we're very selective about when we participate in a trend by being incredibly diversified and ensuring that we never miss what we call these outliers, which are these major material trends. So we're using breakout techniques to capture any of these outliers. Um, breakouts are great to ensure you never miss a trend. So when we're incredibly diversified, that increases our trade frequency. So if we only have, say, four trades for a single market for a single system, and let's say we trade five different trend following systems for that market, that therefore gives five separate return streams for a single market. And then if we're trading 100 markets, potentially on average, um, that might be 500 return streams we're trading. That's significant. As you can see, our sample size increases because we're applying these, these robust trend-following models across any liquid market. So that's a bit different to a typical trader that um, is predictive in nature. So what they might do is they might say, all right, I'm going to use quantitative analysis to undertake a back test for a particular market. And I'm going to look for any repetitive feature or pattern that might exist in that historic data and see if over a sufficient sample, there is some causative linkage between that pattern and how future price will evolve. Now, if I can find that, that there is this repeating regular signal or pattern, and we find that future price evolves in a particular way, I can take that repetitive pattern for that market after a sufficient back test that validates it and apply that to that market. And provided that those patterns persist in the future, there's a high probability I'll be able to extract my edge. So we, we refer to that as a predictive trader because they're, they're looking for price to unfold in a particular way uh, based on how it's, um, how it's um, acted or behaved in the past. Now, that is good for those people that have these predictive models and predictive models tend to be very precise models. What we call, they, they often need many variables because they precisely need to target that pattern that they're trying to hunt. And then when they find that pattern with their models, have an entry signal based on a what we call a highly optimized system to capture that particular pattern, then if that pattern persists, that's great. Now we know over very long-term data sets that these patterns rarely persist over the long term. They're what we call sort of ephemeral in nature. They're like uh, semi-permanent. They might exist for six months. They might exist for a year. They might exist for two years. But over the long term or the career of a trader, let's say a 30, 40 year um, history, they rarely last a very long time because the opportunity in those patterns is typically found by other algorithmic predictive traders who find that opportunity as well. And we get this effectively this cannibalization of that pattern where all of these traders have identified this opportunity and now they start interacting with that pattern and their interactions actually disturb that pattern and the pattern ceases to exist. So uh, with this competition for that particular pattern that typically occurs with 
quantitative strategies that are using this predictive modeling, those patterns often dissipate. And then you're left with what we call strategy hopping. What's the next pattern to find? And it's great when predictive, predictive trading works, but it's not so great when it doesn't work. So when it works, that's great. And you get these lovely ascending equity curves when it's working, but then you suddenly find it might deteriorate or worse still, it might fall off the cliff when these patterns cease to exist. So then it's either find another pattern, find another system that can capitalize on a pattern. So you, you get into this sort of strategy hopping experience over the course of your career where you're always trying to find new patterns. And there's, there's a problem with that because there's a cost associated with all of the, the swapping and the skipping between different trading techniques. Some might be successful, some might not be so successful. You often are really worried about the fact that, hey, has my strategy stopped working or is this simply the nature that the pattern hasn't come up yet? You're always questioning that. But for a trader such as me that's looking at simply following price, I don't fall into that trap. I'm looking for these universal features of a market that can be found in any liquid market. I'm not looking for any particular pattern associated with an individual market. So I'm not optimizing my system for a single market. I'm basically adopting a universal technique applicable to any market and then effectively waiting for those trends to arrive. So I've got to be very patient. And when these material trends arise, I, I never know, I can never predict the outcome of those trends, but my, my back test, the, the academic literature, et cetera, suggests to me that if I apply this repetitive process uh, with discipline and I'm very patient and only wait for these material trends under extensive diversification, so that means I've got to be systematic, not discretionary, because there's so much diversification. A trader trying to do what I do in a discretionary way would have no hope because you know, we're five, trying to manage 500 different return streams, very hard, impossible as a discretionary trader, but as a systematic algorithmic based trader, it's a process. It's fairly easily achieved um, with algorithms. So uh, I'm patient, waiting for these trends to emerge. And then I jump on those trends with no idea whether that's going to work or not. But I do know that over the long term, this tail property nature of these liquid markets reveals these trends, these material trends, far more uh, frequently than what a normal distribution implies. So under the normal distribution, a what we call a five sigma event, uh, which is uh, a move, a price move, five standard deviations away from the mean of that data. A five sigma event is, is predicted to be in a, in a normal distribution A five sigma event is about a one in a 3.3 million chance, which means that if I was trading a, a, just a day trading system, a, a daily um, trading system, um, end of day close or something, I would expect one five sigma event every 3.3 million days. Now, uh, when we look at the S&P 500, for instance, as an index, we see that only in the last 40 years, there's been around about 18 to 20 um, five sigma events. In fact, a large number of them have been greater than 10 sigma events. And whenever you look at any liquid market, corn, coffee, gold, silver, soybeans, Forex, foreign exchange, euro USD, bonds or whatever, when you look at any of them, you find that these, these tail features, these enduring trends are far more frequent than what a, a normal distribution implies. So it says that for those traders that deploy this technique, diversify widely, and what we call bet very small bets on each individual position. So we're only risking very small amounts of our what we call our realized balance, our available trading capital. Not if we only small bet very small amounts have a, a stop in place, a trailing stop in place. So each system will define a trend differently. But if we are applying these diversified systems to these markets, over the course of time, statistics tells you, well, the non-Gaussian statistics tells you that where we get our bread and butter. And a large number of professional fund managers have applied this successfully uh, since the 70s, 80s. There's a large number of big names. And you know, um, you know when, when I looked into this, this game in about 2012, 13, 
I was getting a bit fed up with my career up to there in trading was sort of like a series of ups and a series of downs. Uh, you know, there'd be series times where I thought I couldn't be beaten and there'd be times I thought, let me get out of this place. But in 2012, I said, enough of this volatile psychology that I'm facing. Let's, let's look at who has a validated track record in industry. Because I was also getting a bit sick of the spruikers in, this, um, in the retail world who are saying, it's easy to make money in trading and all of these things. So um, I said, right, the best thing to do, investing a career in any path, such as, you know, you might want to be a doctor, you might want to be a lawyer, you want to be whatever. The first thing is you, you want to stand on the shoulders of giants. You want to only accept ideas from a, a validated track record, not just hearsay. You want to see that validated track record. So I think I was reading a, a book by Andreas Klenau, which is a great book called Diversified Trend Following or whatever, or it might have been one of Covell, Mike Covell's podcast. Um, he's talking about a validated track record of done capital management. And I started looking at who has these validated, audited, verified 30, 40 year track records. And, you know, Warren Buffett's one of them, but there's only one Warren Buffett. George Soros is another one, but there's only one Soros. But there's about 30 to 40 trend followers who have, uh, since um, since January 2000 up to current day, they've outperformed Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. And I thought, goodness me, there are so many of these, these funds that have outperformed Bar Buffett, Soros, et cetera. You know, what is it? Why is it that there are so many of them? And then I realized, well, it's, it's not their cleverness. It's the process they adopt. And that's what got me very excited. And I thought, right, here's an opportunity where I can stand on the shoulders of these, these giants, learn what they do, and apply those principles in my trading. Absolutely, man. This is making so much sense to me why you have picked trend following as your, your system. You touched earlier on hiring a programmer to help you build out algos. How has that programmer, like what have you built in order to help automate your system? Okay. So this this is the exciting thing because mostly when you hear about traders, they, they're usually offering an algorithm that actually trades. We actually don't do that. So what we do is we develop algorithms for what we call a workflow process. In other words, we develop algorithms that help a, a retail trader compile their own trading portfolio. So uh, Fred, who's a programmer I've worked with, I've known him for about 10 years. I met him on Forex Factory, actually, but um, I, I didn't realize he lived very close to me here in um, Brisbane. And uh, we, we were at one of these uh, these trading meetings and uh, we're looking at each other and I thought, gosh, you sound a bit like that bloke I've been speaking to on Forex Factory. And uh, we got to talk and found out we were. <laughs> we were. <laughs> and so I've been working with Fred ever since. And, and Fred's a very good coder. So he specializes um, particularly in uh, the MetaTrader platform and coding within that environment. But he's also very good at coding in languages like Java and, and other languages. But what we decided to do was to use the engine of MetaTrader and develop code around it and within it that would allow us to undertake automated workflow processes to, to develop these very robust, diversified, systematic trend following portfolios, uh, members of our group. So if you could imagine, we're not there to give them algorithms that trade. You know, we, we we don't develop the algorithms ourselves to then give to them to trade their, on their broker's platforms. We give them a process that they can compile their own algorithms, compile them into a portfolio and trade using their own data, their own systems, and also understanding the basis of the backtesting process, how we do it, just to explain. So what we do is, um, let's say there are numerous um, brokers that are offering CFDs, um, commodities, CFDs, they might be offering ETFs, they might be offering foreign exchange as well, most of them do in the MetaTrader environment. But there's a, a large number of them as well that offer quite a large commodity offering as well uh, via CFDs and ETFs. What we do is we say, right, let's get as much possible data as we can from these broker um, sources and develop these very long data sets 
and then let's uh, apply our workflow processes to that data and develop in, in about five different um, stage modules a process that ultimately hones um, the retail trader into a process that allows them to compile very robust portfolios. So it's fairly technical, fairly complex, but uh, we've tried to simplify it. So it, it's just an automated task. But the key thing we ask of our members is to understand what they're doing rather than worry about just producing an end stage bot to trade. Look at the process. Look at terms such as overfitting. How do you avoid overfitting your solutions to make sure that they're universally applicable to any liquid market? How do you, what is, what is this term robustness? How do you ensure that your algorithm is robust. Uh, what is um, a, an adaptive process? In other words, not only should they be robust algorithms, but also they need to adapt over time, recognizing that these markets do change over time. So the nature of trends that we're trying to target will change over time. So is there a process we can deploy in this workflow process in an automated way that ensures there's this adaptive element in the workflow process? So with all of these steps in mind, at the end of the process, then there's this massive compilation of all of these return streams from these um, various systems that Fred's coded up. We allow our members to use. There's about um, six systems at the moment um, or eight. Let's take a quick break from the episode real quick to talk about automating all of your trading strategies. There are so many different tickers and symbols and opportunities every single day, it's impossible to compute it all as a human. So why don't you have a computer trading for you? I don't know. I'll teach you exactly how to algo trade at algotradecamp.com, step-by-step tutorials. I wasn't a coder before. You don't need to be a mathematician. You don't need to go to school for this. You're already ambitious enough to trade. Let's just automate that strategy so we can remove the emotion out of it. So our members can um, use those systems, but they determine the, the variables for their parameter settings on all of those systems. They understand what the systems are, but also um, we can deploy this process in what we call a strategy quant environment. Uh, so strategy quant is a software that allows you to undertake data mining processes for CFDs. Um, we do um, adopt that process for some members who want to develop their own algorithms. So there's a function within Strategy Quant um, called um, Algo Wizard that allows people without coding experience to develop their own algorithms. Um, the in house process that Fred and I offer, we develop those algorithms for our members and then they set the parameters and variables for it. But if they're using Strategy Quant, they can develop their own systems, trend following systems and then test it in a similar process within that environment. I hope that sort of explains things a bit, Moondev. Absolutely, Richard. This is fascinating. I love how you, you give out the system, but you still let your students kind of mess with the variables and find their own way. Uh, you touched on this a bit, but how do you avoid overfitting your algos? And how do you make sure that they're very robust. Okay, so there's there's a few processes that we deploy. So, okay, I've told you that we're, we're targeting these material trends called outliers. And um, I've said that they're pretty well a universal feature found in any liquid market. So we therefore apply very simple models. So the simpler the model, in other words, the simpler entry rules, the simpler exit rules, the simpler risk management rules, the simpler it is and the less variables used, the less it is optimized for a particular prescriptive price pattern. The more simple they are, the more that they can address many different forms of generic price pattern that have similar directional attributes, but they don't have to be precise price patterns. Because as you can imagine, the more variables you add to your strategy, the more it what we call curve fits for the solution you're trying to target. Now, over-optimization can be a problem uh, when you find that you're applying this process of adding variables based on a backtest, when a lot of that backtest is, is simply random noise. So what you find is that with these very over-optimized systems, they can, 
instead of distilling the particular signal or pattern you want from that data, they find that they get curved fit to the noise in that data, which means that for those particular type of trading models, even though they've had a marvelous back test and you've had this amazing equity curve, when they go to the live environment, they immediately fall off the cliff and deteriorate. So what that means is that they were over-optimized to random noise as opposed to any causative signal. And that's what causes them suddenly to plummet because that that noise, that random noise, well, the future is always different to the past. And so any small variation to that backtest in the future is going to make these things fall off the cliff and deteriorate. Now, that, that, is, um, that is typically associated with this over-optimization, too many variables in your system, trying to prescriptively classify your model to target a particular form of price pattern. So the simpler we are, the broader its capacity to um, not be over-optimized for a particular price pattern, but more generic in nature. Um, the other thing we do is every single one of our models must be demonstrated in a backtest to perform, at least have a slight edge over a 30 to 40 year data history of the principal market it's going to trade and every single other liquid market in our portfolio. So if we're trading... 100 markets, it is, it's not actually prescriptive to every single, but let's say that we've undertaken um, a back test for a trend following model on the Euro USD. It's come out really well. It's not only got to pass the Euro USD, it's got to pass at least 75%, 80% of all of the other markets in our portfolio. If it passes that and generates positive expectancy with at least say 80% of all of these other markets. Now, the, what we do to ensure that trend following model can be traded across any liquid market is we normalize that model using ATR to define where it stops posi is positioned, its position size, and its trailing stop. So that normalization process means that we can trade cryptocurrencies the same way as we trade bonds, the same way as we trade equities, the same way as we trade any other liquid market because we're normalizing it using ATR. So therefore, this model that we've developed for EURUSD, we can apply to all of the other markets in our portfolio. And if it passes 80% in the, what we call the multi-market test, that is what we have a big tick say, yes, that's robust because that entire test is not only across 30 to 40 years of the primary market Euro USD that possibly it's going to trade on, but also 30 to 40 years of 80% of 100 other markets. You can see that there's a massive sample size that it's demonstrated it's passed on by virtue of the fact it's traded Euro USD and 80% of the other markets. So we've significantly increased the trade sample to give validity in our technique that it is not over-optimized for a single market. It's shown that it can uh, attack this universal principle called outliers in any of these liquid markets. That's the second step. That's the multi-market. But also the, the big benefit of trading these outliers is that visually, in hindsight, they're very easy to identify. We're always trading on that right end edge of the chart. So we don't know what the future is going to give. So even though we might be noticing that there's a big trending condition, it's got to a material level where we're saying, let's enter, and our signals have said, let's enter that trend. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. So you can always identify an outlier in hindsight, but never in foresight when you're trading. it. So because we can identify these outliers in hindsight, when we do a back test with our models, we can identify visually on any of those charts where those outliers are. They're, they're obvious. They stand out because they're such big material price moves. So what we do is we say, right, how did our, mark, how did our models perform during those periods where outliers were present? And how did our models perform during periods where there were no outliers? So they're very important questions, those two, because let's look at the where there were no outliers. If we found that our systems were actually producing positive, profitable results when outliers were absent, that would be saying that they're overfit to noise. If they have been stagnating or incurring small drawdowns during those periods where outliers were absent, that's actually a tick for our models because it's doing what our models were designed to do. Even though those opportunities weren't present in that market data, we shouldn't expect these growing equity curves from a model that's designed to capture trends when trends are absent.
But we also check when these, ab these outliers were present using hindsight. How did our models perform then? And we want to see that our models are, are capturing the fruits of those outliers. We want to see our performance improve during those periods of outliers. So that's another test that we can actually visually do because these things are such significant visual features. We can do what we call map to market, which is where we basically map our equity curves against the market data. And we locate where the outliers were in the market data, and we do a vertical line down to our equity curve and see how's our equity curve going during that particular point in time. Was it improving? If so, tick. If there's no trends in the market data and we come down to our equity curve, we should see drawdowns or stagnation. We shouldn't see an increasing equity curve. That's a sort of a last check to ensure that our models are not overfit. So once we've done all of those three processes, we're pretty sure that they're robust. That makes a lot of sense, Richard. I see why your models are super robust now. You had mentioned that you will trade and diversify up to 100 markets or more. Talk to me a little bit about that and how does the diversification across all of these markets play into your risk management systems? Okay, so if you can imagine, um, the portfolio itself comprises hundreds of return streams. So let's say we're trading 100 different markets and we're trading five trend-following systems for each market. There's 500 um, return streams. So if you can imagine visually, when you look at all of those 500 equity curves of those individual return streams, it looks like spaghetti. But the, the idea is that each system itself cannot contribute to excessive risk in the portfolio. So each system must have a stop and a trailing stop to cut losses short, but let profits run. So there's a golden rule being applied here for every single system that's deployed to every single market. It must cut losses short, but let profits run. As you can see, and also we've got to be bi-directional. We've got to take opportunities when trends are bullish or going long in direction and take opportunities when trends are bearish and going short in direction. So we're bi-directional, opportunistic, looking for these material trends up or down. We either ride them up or we ride them down. But following entry, at, at entry, we for every single system we deploy, we are position sizing that system to only risk a very small risk bet of a defined amount that is the same risk for every single return stream in our portfolio. So let's say that uh, we only want to risk, let's say, 25 basis points or 0.25% of our realized balance. That's uh, that's the balance of our equity curve when all of our, uh, of our closed trades, not including open trade equity, just our closed trades. What is our balance? Let's risk 25 basis points or 0.25% for the next month for every single trade that we take in our portfolio for every return stream. So we're using an ATR and a multiplier to then decide where our stop is going to be located based on the volatility of that particular stock on entry. So we're using an ATR and a multiplier, but then we're only risking, let's say, $500 per trade. And say we had a, an account of $100,000. That I think that's 0.5, that's 50 basis points. So let's halve that. Uh, let's say we risk $250 per trade. So we know the dollar amount, the risk $250. We know our ATR and our multiple of ATR that we're applying. So then we can define an exact position size for every single market that we trade over the course of the next month that we'll apply based on a, that approach. That defines where our stop goes. That stop is effectively uh, defined during this extensive data backtesting that we do 30, 40 years across all of these different markets. Um, it's a pretty powerful process, but it's defining where is the stop optimally placed to give me maximum degrees of freedom for price to wiggle about and be random, but not get me into deep water with an adverse loss? That's where the stop goes. And then the trailing stop, there's always a trailing stop. We, so we don't have a profit target for any system. We use a trailing stop that uses what we call a, it's a chandelier exit where it's using an assessment of ATR and a, and a, and a, a multiplier that's um, always making sure that the stop never goes backwards. Um, if we're making a bit of profit out of that trade, the, the, stop, the trailing stop is slowly ratcheting up behind us, but within giving enough breathing room using ATR and a multiple of ATR to allow that trend to still have degrees of freedom in price movement, 
but it's to protect any adverse risk that might occur if the trend was suddenly to end. And uh, we, we don't want to find that we, uh, we don't make any money off that trend. So we always like trailing a, a profit target behind our trends to over the, the long term, when the trend ends, it touches that, that trail and exits the trend. And that's when each system, even though they're configured differently, says, right, for my particular system, which defines trend this particular way, the trend's ended when you get out of that trade. Now, as you probably know, Moondev, when so many people interpret trends differently. So, and that's that's true because uh, there are many different forms of trend. In fact, most traders actually do trade trends. They might trade a, a style called mean reversion, but that's still trading directionally trending price data. But the particular type of trends, the material trends that I'm looking for are what we call these secular trends, these huge outliers that extend in direction. But other people might be looking for short, shorter term trends that have a finite duration. If that's the case, then yes, profit targets are very valid and they might put profit targets around the equilibrium of the, the mean of that uh, that oscillation that they're trying to target. But we don't. We just have a, a trailing exit. So each of those systems is configured that way. Then at the portfolio level, you can imagine we've got 500 return streams. So ideally, each of those return streams wants to be uncorrelated with each other. That's the ideal scenario. So if you could imagine, if all of our return streams were correlated uh, with each other, in other words, when, when one return stream went up, all of the other return streams went up. When one return stream went down, all of the other return streams went down. That's what we call a positively correlated relationship. If we found that that was the case with our portfolio, if you could imagine when we have 500 return streams, each risking 25 basis points, if they're all going down together, that can lead to a massive risk event. In other words, 500 times 25 basis points, assuming that we were trading or active in all of those 500 return streams, that would be a massive risk event for us. The key thing is to trade uncorrelated markets. So there's a game we play where some of the uncorrelated markets can be identified through market selection, but there is no guarantee when we're looking at the correlated nature of markets that they don't change over time. So they might stay in place for many years. For instance, the bond equity relationship, your bonds offered a, a negatively correlated relationship with equities for the last 20 years until 2022, where we found that the correlation suddenly flipped and suddenly bonds offered no protection to equities anymore post 2022. But it had a relationship being sort of fairly negatively correlated. And negatively correlated means when one goes up, the other goes down. It's sort of the inverse of the positively correlated relationship. But with our trend following models, we want an uncorrelated relationship. In other words, we're not looking for positive or negative um, correlation. We're looking for uncorrelated, which means that each uh, market tends to operate independently to another. So you can imagine that Many, many markets you could trade, but many, many markets are fairly highly correlated with each other. So we're always on the lookout for unique markets that offer unique attributes. So when cryptocurrencies came out with Bitcoin, of course, we were quick to say, oh, Bitcoin's a nice diversifier for our portfolios because it's going to be different to um, the currencies. It's going to be different to the bonds. It's going to be different to the commodities. But you can also see why commodities are such a big deal for our form of technique, because unlike, say, equities, which tend to uncorrelated during bull markets, but when things uh, you get into equity crisis periods like 2008, all of the equities all go down together. That's where suddenly you see that there's a massive flip from uncorrelated to positively correlated uh, in these extreme equity crises. You also find that to a degree in bonds and fixed income. But commodities, because of the unique commodities we trade, like soybeans, wheat, gold, silver, they're very unrelated to each other. And those that unrelated logic basically means that they're probably going to be less correlated than other markets. So there's no guarantee that correlation persists in the markets, but system diversification, where we're deploying different types of trend following system, yes, we can start embedding some structural factors into our models, such as where the entry is, where the stop is. These structural things ensure 
that we can develop a degree of uncorrelated relationship with the other models we trade. So this is where we look at what we call principles of correlation and principles of, of um, covariance. No, there, there's another term anyway, where we embed these structural limitations to enforce a degree of uncorrelated relationship in our models. So by system diversification and market diversification, the idea being is we want to achieve maximum diversification because if you could imagine for an outlier hunter like me who's trading these models, these outliers are few and far between, but they are prevalent across all these liquid markets. But I want to ensure I have maximum diversification to basically capture these opportunities wherever they occur. For me, a massive sin is to miss an outlier. If I've got a system trading a market that doesn't capture an outlier, there's something wrong with my models. I ensure that I must participate in all outliers because you never know what trends are going to turn into outliers. That's always a hindsight statement. But so you've got to wait till they become material. And so if you could imagine, you're not participating in all trends or in all price movement. You're being very selective where you are defining where your entries are. So if you could imagine you are trying to um, select entries that are more characteristic of the tail regions of the distribution. So they're a few sigma deviations away from the mean before you even start participating in these material trends. So you're waiting, waiting. Most people think that the trend's about to end when we are actually trying to enter. So our approach is a very counterintuitive approach. It's sort of, it's saying, okay, we recognize that most traders make their errors because of trader bias or behavioral bias. So we're going to capitalize on that. So when most people think a trend is about to end, that's a predictive mindset saying, oh, this trend's been going for a long time. It must end. So it hasn't yet, but they're saying in their predictive mind, they're saying it must end. So they're expecting it to mean revert. We are saying, oh, hey, we follow the trend. We don't have any predictive bias. We're just going to jump in when you guys are saying you think it's over. And because of these behavioral biases, sometimes we're very successful. Other times we're not. We get these small losses because we've got these small stops with these tight stops to cut losses short. So we're never, we're always trying to mitigate large risk events through placement of stops, trailing stops, the small bet size. So in these very wildly moving markets out in the extremes where, where we often find ourselves trading, you find often that, that stops and trailing stops are not observed because sometimes the price move is so fast and so volatile, it can actually run through your stops. So you, you might need guaranteed stops in the instance, but we don't do that. What we do is a very small bet size we apply to each is is really our risk avoidance mechanism because it says, all right, let's say I'm only risking 25 basis points. Let's say it doesn't observe my stop and the maximum, you know, in those instances, I, I traded during that, what we call the Swiss market DPEG, if you remember back in 2014, there was a massive event where the Swiss dollar was DPEGed as a currency and there was a massive risk event. But because I was using these models, risking at that time 50 basis points per trade or 0.5%. The maximum risk I had of slippage was 2%. So it didn't wipe me out. And that's because I was trading such small bet sizes, but across a very diversified portfolio. So small bets is your best form of defense. Stops and trailing stops are ways you release risk from your portfolio. So that means that our trend-following portfolios are continually releasing risk. We're not holding on to risk which means that our portfolios are always in a position because it's releasing risk all the time through these stops being hit and trailing stops being exited. Because it's releasing that risk, our portfolios are always able to take on future risk as opposed to holding on to past risk. So we don't average down into our trades. We don't hold on to risk, what we call warehousing risk. These methods to us are, are really go against our philosophy of cutting losses short. I hope I've answered most things there, Moondev. Absolutely, Richard. That, that was great. I totally understand how you're managing risk by using small bet sizes across multiple markets. That's super fascinating. I guess the one last thing I want to touch on here is you had mentioned something about how every trader sees a trend a little bit differently. And I mean, of course, right? Uh, we all have different outlooks on the market. But how do you measure that first breakout when a trend is developing? So I, I mentioned before that I only um, participate when trends get material. So for instance, I 
I regard myself as what we call a medium to long-term trader. So I don't trade intraday. Um, I don't trade the hourly bars. I don't trade the four hourly bars. I trade the daily bars. And my entries are using what we call look back periods. So if I'm using a, a breakout entry using, let's say, for example, a Donkian channel, your listeners might be familiar with a Donkian channel. So the idea is that a Donkian channel looks um, using a look back of the last X number of, of periods, it says what was the highest high over that range and what was the lowest low. And it plots a, a channel to do that highest high and highest low. I'll use a Donkian channel of, say, for some systems, say 50 days up to, say, 200 days look back. So what that's meaning is that I will not participate in the normal churn of the the normal markets until we get a material price move that is either breaking out through that upper Donkin channel or breaking down through that lower Donkin channel using a look back of between 50 to say 200 days. So it's long-term, medium to long-term. Um, I do use other techniques with other systems, moving average crossovers, but all of the look lookbacks tend to be ranging from about 50 out to 200. That's sort of the range. So that's therefore giving me a, a range of trend-following systems that I call a my lingo short-term, medium-term, long-term. But the average hold of my systems for all of them is about 80 days. Some of them I'm holding for years. So you can imagine most traders would be saying, well, that's very long term because I'm trading a four hour or I'm trading a two week or I'm trading two days. So in my terminology, I say short, medium, long term, because that's the terminology we tend to use in our trend following world, because we're looking at these uh, longer term lookbacks because we're looking at material price moves. And that's that we're trying to force our trading activity to be representative of occurring when those tail regions, we're starting to enter those tail regions of the distribution. We want to avoid over trading and too much trading during just the normal everyday market activities, because that's either what we call uh, a mean reverting trend which we don't want to capture because they've got a, a finite duration, you know, when it gets to the equilibrium, or it might be a random trend created by random noise. We want to avoid all what we call the bulk of the distribution and focus our trades on, on the edge. So I hope that answered it. Absolutely. Richard, this conversation has been absolutely fascinating. What is a good book or two you suggest all traders to read? And then where can traders reach you? Sure. So the book I'd recommend is um, from Andreas Klanow, and it's called, I think it's Diversified Trend Following or Managed Futures, Diversified Trend Following of Managed Futures by Andreas Klanow. Now, the reason I really love this book is it's more than just a, a talk fest like, you know, Jack Schwager's Market Wizards, which is a great book to find out the nature of famous traders. But what I wanted was a book that to taught me the rules and processes of how to actually think about trend following. And that Andreas Klenow book was a fantastic book that did that. So that's a, probably the book that really kickstarted my career in this um, area of, of trading because it really uh, offered assistance, practical guidance in how to develop these things. So it was really handy. But um, and what was the other question, Moondev? It was, where can traders reach out to you and find you online? Sure. So they can get me on my Twitter handle, uh, which is at richb118. They can get me at my uh, LinkedIn under Richard Brennan. And they can also get me on my website at atstradingsolutions.com. So atstradingsolutions, or one word, dot com. That'll get me. It's wonderful, Richard. This has been an absolute pleasure. pleasure. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks very much for listening. Yes, yeah. so much. Yeah, I really appreciate it. I look forward to chatting here in the future and I hope you have a wonderful day. Okay, thanks very much, Moon Dev. All right, that's a wrap. If you enjoyed that episode as much as I did, definitely jump into my free Discord for traders. We have the biggest trading and algo trading community out there and it's free to join. All you have to do is search on YouTube, Moon Dev, find one of my videos and you'll see in the description your free invite to our Discord. So I look forward to seeing you inside the community and on the next episode. Have a wonderful day.